So, we have two hosts tonight for tonight's dinner. We owe this lovely dinner to, uh, to the MacArthur Foundation and the MasterCard Foundation. So please give a toast to Bob and Rita. And I just wanted to check in for a second. How'd you guys like hearing from Darren Walker today? <laughs> He's a rock star. And you know what I really loved? I loved Keem and Sally and Peter and Fred on leadership. I just thought that was huge. That was really great. That was really great. So, you know, Darren kind of threw down the gauntlet and said, well, we're not all that good in philanthropy when it comes to collaboration. We've got a way to go. And, you know, Bob and Rita were apparently anticipating this two years ago and came fully prepared. They've been engaged in a really fascinating collaboration uh, when it comes to secondary school education in the developing world. Um, and it's been sort of filled with, with learnings and successes and, uh, and new plans ahead. And so before we start with a conversation with both Bob and Rita to talk about this very deep collaboration, not just between them, but with, uh, with several other organizations, we're just going to say a, a very quick uh, film about it and then invite them to the stage. In recent decades, primary education has become universal in nearly every corner of the world. But in far too many poor and rural parts of developing countries, the opportunity to continue learning at the secondary level is still out of reach. Cost, distance, and capacity are frequent barriers. Governments and donors based all the emphasis on the basic education. However, most of the costs for secondary education were left to the parents, and so many fell out. And gender bias makes the challenges even more severe for girls. We know that India loses a significant amount of uh, economic benefits because of school dropouts. It's almost like your economy running on half a leg. Beyond the economic benefits, secondary education leads to improvements in health, human rights, living standards, and even environmental quality. Secondary school means that you can actually look towards a different future. It's with a different future in mind that a partnership of international donors is investing in innovative ideas to create opportunities for quality learning at the secondary level. Projects in India, East Africa, and Nigeria are showing what can be done to overcome barriers and make a real difference. Pratham always looks at what is going to create an impact. The idea is to give the dropouts a second chance to complete their education. So it is with this that Pratham Open School for Education started in seven states. By combining occasional classroom instruction with village-based tutoring, the Pratham Open School is making education more accessible to dropouts, and it's giving students new hope. It need not be that everyone becomes engineers, but everyone is equipped to live a life in a better way or take a step ahead in life. In 20 pilot schools across Kenya and Tanzania, the Global eSchools and Communities Initiative is equipping teachers with skills and technological tools that enhance science, English, and math instruction. The main focus of the project actually is the training of teachers. Teachers are in their schools learning while teaching at the same time. We are taking the technology to the classroom where learning takes place, as opposed to the computer lab, which limits the number of students that access the technology in a school. That's good, that's good. Let's clap for ourselves. It makes learning more enjoyable to the students. The retention of concepts is quite high. Now I can understand very fast. I get the concept very easily. It's very interesting. In the rural northern Nigerian communities served by the Center for Girls' Education, early marriage and pregnancy greatly limit the life prospects of many adolescent girls. Staying in school opens a new path. Through education, you'll be able to reduce a lot of problems of women. Child morbidity, 
maternal mortality, sickness, diseases, and the rest. The center pays for school fees that many families cannot afford, and it's created village girls' clubs called Safe Spaces, where mentors provide tutoring in English, math, and skills the girls need for successful lives. We teach them numeracy and literacy and life skills, even cooking, a lot of things. We are trying to make them have confidence, make them uh, be able to speak for themselves. I believe that an educated mother will never want her own child not to be educated. Poverty will reduce, people will be healthy, and children will not die. One day, we will wake up to our dreams. Everybody is striving towards educating his or her child. So come on up and join us. First, Toyin, Toyin is the Center for Girls' Education. Is that in, in the state where you're first lady? Where first lady? No, it's a different state. Ah, uh, ah, uh, okay. <laughs> but it's inspiring. Let me let me just sort of say that there's the, the the two foundations today announced. Oh, goodbye, goodbye, Bob. You're sinking in. <laughs> <laughs> we can give you a. They don't use telephone books anymore, Bob. It's <laughs> wonderful. So the, the the two foundations today announced fifteen million dollars in grants for this initiative, and an additional thirteen million for the year ahead to look at both quality and relevance of secondary school education. So that will it was quite a good day. Yeah, a good day. So Rita, would, would you just open by saying a word about how this, how this partnership came about? How did you come together all around Bob's this? It's all Bob's fault. It's all Bob's fault. Yeah. It's, all, it all, it's all Bob's fault. Um, both of our foundations are part of a, an organization, uh, or part of a gathering called the Global Compact on Learning, or, um, uh, which is supported by the Brookings Institution. And it was an opportunity for us to connect with different funders who are very interested in education, and both of us expressed an interest in secondary education. And at some point during the time, I think when your colleagues were developing the secondary education strategy, you came by and visited us up in cold Toronto, but beautiful mm -hmm. Toronto, and floated the idea of, could we do something together? And it sounded, yeah, I said we could do something together. Uh, let's, let's, let's try something. So that something, which was, began very organically, has now morphed into this fantastic partnership. Yeah, yeah. And before we get to talking about learning about learning, what you've learned about learning, what have you learned about collaboration? First of all, that if you're going to go to cold Toronto, it's good to be going from warm Chicago. Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I think uh, the the first very first thing is that goals align. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean they're identical, and indeed, actually, they're not. And uh, I think we probably have a, a more emphasis on on girls, uh, mm -hmm. and, and than than you do. I think uh, certainly in terms of geographic area, we were in different areas. Uh, Rita's foundation much more and. East Africa, we were really newbies in East Africa. We have offices in Nigeria and in, in India, but not really in East Africa. We wanted to work there, but yeah. we, could learn, we knew we could learn a lot uh, from MasterCard there. Um, I think that, uh, that the staffs work so well together. Mm -hmm. It's been Absolutely. just incredible. Uh, there's a, a plus to collaboration in philanthropy, and that is that we are in, in a non-competitive environment which uh, I don't think we, uh, if we, we recognize it enough and, and when we're talking about why things work or not. Uh, I think though that after you get finished with these um, uh, very rational uh, uh, propositions, 
it is still true, I don't know if you've recently heard uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Larry Kramer, talk about why collaboration doesn't happen more often, and it was a very nice piece he did. Larry is president of the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, there are generally inhibitions because it's harder, quote, to work with others than just do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think it was taking on something as big as uh, secondary education for the most deprived people on the planet in Africa and South Asia that we recognized that not only us working together, but eventually creating the partnership, drawing in others, and then looking to see how we could, as a collective, leverage governments, which at the end of the day needed to be part of any reasonable strategy to address secondary education. So I think all those things uh, came together, but, but mostly it's Rita's fault. It's mostly Rita's fault. I always knew that. But you've referred to this, and the foundation refers to this, um, this whole enterprise as exploratory, that you're in fact developing the knowledge that will then give you the theory of change on which you'll rely. And I'm wondering, you know, I understand that this knowledge will inform your grant making, both of your grant making, and will inform the grantees. But what about others? What about getting that information into the hands of governments, for example, as you say, they're, they're key players in this, but also in the hands of other philanthropists who have similar goals? You're, you're staring at me. So, I'm staring at you. Um, the learning, first of all, if I can just put a plug in for assessment and evaluation, that that learning is going to come from, probably the best of it is going to come from a concentrated effort to learn from what you're doing and isn't just going to spill out as a result of, a, of a, an NGO doing its job in a, in a particular school. So a, a designed assessment of individual activities of NGOs uh, a designed evaluation of the impact of full programs uh, in which you have a feedback lip, loop that's pretty tight, so that in time I mean tight, so that you're immediately trying to get the outcomes mm -hmm. and understand whether, what's working in a particular geographic area, what's working in a certain circumstance. I mean, the Pratham case is a very special case for an invention, but, but that is designed particularly for that case, not one necessarily that you pick up and you put someplace else. Right. I think that the learning you're talking about first comes because you have the assessment and evaluations in place and you have a method of sharing that information with each other. And then as you said, with those you wish to influence, not least of which uh, is the government. Because mm -hmm. let's, we, we had such a great conversation about leadership earlier in the day that I wanted you to pick up on that, Rita, if you would, um, and talk a little bit about about philanthropic leadership and what whether part of your job as a leader is to uh, advance field-wide learning. Is that a trick question, or <laughs> the, the answer is absolutely yes. I think that uh, just to add on to what Bob said a moment ago. Leadership in this space is about finding ways to certainly make collaboration a core competency of philanthropy. That, that's number one. And it's something that you don't see often enough. Uh, it takes certainly, you know, as I learned that you, you can juggle bread rolls, you told me a moment I ago. Could. So you, could, you could have a demonstration in a few minutes. But it takes working with um, others who share similar values, uh, who are also driven. Uh, by the same, uh, by the same vision, mm -hmm. but it, and it also takes creating the environment for our teams to work together mm -hmm. and to have some license to experiment and to try new things, and so this process has been somewhat organic uh, from the get go. But as as we grow, as we um, expand the network of both partners as well as other funders, we'll, we'll be experimenting with new ways of learning and leading. Um, this enterprise is all is absolutely designed from from the outset to generate evidence evidence which is shockingly missing uh, in in terms of what works in secondary education how teachers learn how teachers can be effective how we deploy technology um, and how do we make curricula absolutely relevant to what's available in the marketplace so young people abs can transition and they can transition with ease to jobs to, or to create jobs of their own, you know, to create their own livelihoods. The other piece around leadership is that leadership needs to occur at all levels. It's not just uh, at, the, 
uh, foundations. It's uh, within the partners, the organizations which are absolutely at the front line. And it's leadership which is going to really listen. I think to take something Kennedy or Dede said the other day, it's about listening. It's about listening to um, certainly our, our partners, the organizations doing the work, but it's also listening to young people in this case, and listening to young women and what they want and, what, and how they wish to learn. It's listening to teachers who have this incredible responsibility to educate the next generation. Mm -hmm. I think that, that's, that's, the, that's the leadership. We're gonna hear from Groove Rutland tomorrow who's, who's among the elders and they often talk about leadership being all about having a listening ear. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so Bob, you are making some assumptions though about how uh, secondary school education outcomes might affect other issues of, of interest like, like health, um, like equity. Uh, like uh, obviously preparation for employment, but what, what are the assumptions that you are making about how this, how secondary education interacts with various development goals? Mm. Um, I think you could come to a conclusion that secondary education is a good thing lots of different ways, uh, but for me, I have been struck since I entered the world of philanthropy five years ago uh, and thought, tried to think more or in an organized way about um, political and economic development, that uh, there were contending models for how one can promote this, how it is achieved, why it, this happens in some regions and not in others, in some countries and not in others. And there are lots of candidates for the, uh, the single variable, independent variable, uh, which none of which are particularly appealing to me right at this moment. But what is appealing is finding things that are definitely antecedent to other things, that are definitely drivers. And um, I'm persuaded that education is one such. Uh, we heard at the very beginning of the film that we've had a lot of success internationally in, in these areas with primary education. Uh, if we want to have more success, I would argue, and political and economic development, we must move on to secondary education. So one basic connection is the fundamental one of the developing world, whether it's Africa or South Asia, uh, of getting more children, young people, who should be in secondary education, in secondary education for the good of the economy. That's one wholly apart from the ethical reasons of giving the individuals life choices, as Rita was suggesting, that are much greater than they have now. For us, uh, where we have had for a long time, long before I went to the foundation, a program aimed at reducing maternal mortality, mm -hmm. there's such a direct connection between each, every single year that you can keep a girl in secondary education connection between that and the age of marriage, the age of first child, the number of children, uh, and then the life choices that the woman has to contribute to the economic and political development of the society, yeah. that the connections are well documented, they're clear, uh, and they give us every reason to put resources against this problem. And so this is an issue area that actually touches on almost every aspect of your international grant making right now. Absolutely, so absolutely. It's, yeah, yeah, so it's a, sort of a, a connector of them all. So the focus is, is Africa, the focus is South Asia. Are the, st are the, are the data particularly bad when it comes to uh, girls moving from primary to secondary education? Is that where you're, you're the parts of the world where you're seeing that drop off, that, that next step not occurring, and why? Uh, well, without question, in sub-Saharan Africa, if we were to compare that region to other regions of the world, uh, it absolutely lags, <clears throat> not just in terms of secondary education, but also in higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, what is shocking and surprising is um, how much we don't know. I mean, we know that education is good, and so we're not, there, we're not here to prove that experiment. That, that's been done. But we're not clear, or evidence is weak, about what really works in the classroom mm -hmm. uh, or in what works outside the classroom. We're, not sh we're unclear about uh, interventions around technology, uh, incentives for teachers, uh, how best to engage 
students with different forms of learning. That, that's the evidence which we're seeking to build. So one of the exciting things about the partnership is from the outset, we also engaged results for development to partner with, uh, with us and with all of the organizations which are participating in this initiative to sort of help us map out what are the learning questions? Where, where does evidence exist? And where do we need to create new evidence? What are the gaps we need to fill? So that's part of the I mean, journey. I know you also work with J-PAL a bit, and one of the things, Rachel Gunnister is here, and, and one of the, the, the really useful things, one of the many useful things J-PAL does, the Poverty Action Lab does, is identify those places where we think we know something, but we really don't, right? right. And so I can imagine that that relationship helps you tee up some questions where we've got assumptions, but Actually, you referred to curriculum, for example. I think one of the things they say is, we're not quite sure which curriculums make a difference. Yeah, I, I think it, it's, it's this, the substance of the intervention. I mean, it, it, having uh, the children, the young people in school uh, where that can happen has got to be a good thing for a variety of reasons, social reasons and other reasons. But the character of the intervention, the educational intervention, is another matter. Its relevance to jobs, as we've both made that point, is important. But what actually works? I mean, in, in the uh, domestic American context at MacArthur, we have, we have a, a program aimed at digital media and learning, which uh, we think is pretty relevant to our context. <clears throat> and I, but I wouldn't have reason right now at this moment to suspect it, it can be transported directly to one or another of the contexts that we're thinking about right here in this conversation. So we do, as you suggest, need to find out what works and what doesn't. The, the gold standard for lots of people is the RCT, the Randomized Control Trial. And yes, when, when that's the right thing to do and it can be done properly, I'm, I'm prepared to believe it, it ought to be done. That can always be done, and we need to have alternatives to that to do assessments and evaluation. But I absolutely agree that uh, that gives you a unique insight into what works. You know, the film referred to the Prothom grant, so I just wanted to, to, to get a sense of, yeah. of that particular grant and what you're learning from it. Well, the first thing uh, I want to say again is that I think probably getting, uh, in almost every context, getting the the child to go to school has special payoff in terms of delivering a curriculum and social payoff as well. But in that case, in the Pratham case, we're, we're talking about our, uh, sometimes girls who have dropped out, girls who cannot be sent to school. For a variety of reasons, um, that model, the model we, that you want to have in other places is not going to work. Rather than abandoning um, those girls, you look for another model. And this one has the instructor, the teacher, go to the village in an organized sort of way and deliver the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the initial indications are uh, that it's a successful way of proceeding. Yeah. 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 So, and I also wanted to ask, um, ask you, Rita, of what we're learning about, about various kinds of teacher training uh, initiative, particularly the, the child-centered mm -hmm. approach. And I, I think some of the grants touched on that. Yes, in fact, one of the um, organizations featured in the little film just a moment ago is JESSE, the Global E-Schools and Communities Initiative. So we're, we are very, very excited to work with this organization. It, it, fundamentally, it's trying to understand how can we make teachers more effective in the classroom, but without removing them from the classroom. How do we bring training that's cost effective, that is real time, which is going to give them feedback directly, and this en engages teachers in using technology, computers, uh, accessing information off the internet to make their curricula and their um, uh, you know, classroom materials much more engaging for young people. So I was talking to Esther, who was uh, on the film a moment ago, and she explained how they're looking at change in the classroom. And certainly at the end of the day, it's all about outcomes. What are children learning? But how do you actually document that change that's happening? So she explained two or three levels of how we're investigating uh, and measuring and documenting change. First was simply, what is the school administration, what do they think? How are they supporting uh, this initiative? And it could be as simple as uh, the school administrator saying, you know what, we don't have enough electrical sockets 
in a particular room for computers to be plugged in. We need to buy airtime. We should invest in modems. These seem so simple, and yet at the same time, they form part of the evidence base of how change is occurring. The second one was very, very simple. It touched my heart. Uh, she said, we have teachers who are absolutely terrified of technology because it's something they haven't encountered. And by the end of the, the training with master trainers for these teachers, they're actually downloading material from the web. And it could be teaching, they could be teaching a class on pollination, where they are illustrating uh, how that takes place uh, and engaging young people. And most importantly, because the, most of this is done around science and technology and math, uh, it's the young children, the children themselves, you know, so children who, how engaged they are, are they asking questions? And are they learning? Mm. And one of the things we, I think we all have an opinion on, but we don't really know what we're talking about, at least in my case, I don't know what I'm talking about, and that is the role of families and communities. Mm. We have a deep sense that it, that it must be, uh, you know, the families and communities are, are really essential to the learning process and the role they play. But then do we understand more than that? Have any of your grants related, tested some of the questions about their role? I think to some degree the answer is yes. Um, I, we had, uh, the audience should know, we had a division of labor uh, when we prepared for this, and any hard question would go to Rita, and, <laughs> and I would get the others. Uh, so this to me is a hard question. Uh, I, I, I'm right here, Bob. No. I, I'm counting on that. <laughs> I think one of, the, one, of the, but one of the easy things to say to a hard question is that um, in certain communities, uh, a, there's a, a con special concern about girls' vulnerability when they go to or travel anywhere. Second, there's a, uh, just a lack of interest in the education of the girl child if, it's, if it is, as the film correctly pointed out, a cost factor and there are boy children. Uh, so that those kinds of factors certainly are teased out in, in, um, in some of the interventions uh, that we're looking at. And I, I th overall, the importance of getting the family and the parents completely committed to the education of the kids beyond the primary level, and if it's a girl particularly through the secondary level, is part of the challenge of, of the whole mission of girls' secondary education. And now I defer to Rita. <laughs> Rita, would you like to pick up? Sure. <laughs> well, well um, I'll take a stab at it. One of the exciting parts about this partnership is the ability to facilitate learning across the world, and especially what we would call South-South learning. So one of the projects is uh, working with an organization called the International Center for Child Development. And they have been very successful in India to mobilize communities to enable girls to go to, go to school. Mm -hmm. And so we're bringing them to Kenya to share what they have learned in terms of help engaging communities. It's just parents, it's about school teachers, it's about um, religious leaders in the community to actually identify what are the barriers yeah. and then to help them articulate what could be the solutions. So that type of learning, so it gets to families, but it also gets to the community. Yeah, and I think the, the, there's a pop co uh, council grant that relates a little bit yes. to parental involvement too. And what's fascinating about this is that it, it is possible not only to have South-South learning, but learning across the board. Across the board, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that that, always, that often gets debated is sort of the role of compensation and the quality of a teacher. If there's any relationship between how much they're paid and and how effective they are as teachers. Is that one of the issues that you all are looking at, or you're more at teacher, the... teacher compensation? Yes. I, I, I don't know that we are. We may be, but you, I don't know if you know. No, I don't think so. <laughs> not, not directly. I bet there's so, someone in the audience who does. With this. Well, it's something <laughs> Rachel will know, for sure. Absolutely. And we, I think we should turn to the audience in, in a minute. I just wanted to actually test out some, to, to just hmm. bring you, uh, Rita, back to um, uh, the, the whole idea of education that's relevant to the workplace of the future mm -hmm. and get a sense of, you know, to what degree are you looking at vocational education or what, you know, what, what is it that, what is the world you're preparing these girls or these boys and girls mm -hmm. for, uh, but it's primarily girls, I take it, um, and actually you need to correct me on that. Am I right in thinking it's boys and girls? It is boys and girls, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, and, but we too, you know, obviously want to create a space for girls. Yeah. The hurdles are higher. Yeah. 
So, I mean, I think... Your question is... is my question is, what was my question? <laughs> vocational um, education? Something? It was vocational education, but it was also just, as a general matter, what are you preparing them for? What is the skill set you're finding they need to have? Do they need to, you know, be highly agile, in which case they need a pretty broad educational background, or do you need to think in terms of specific skills? I think it's a combination of several things. So in, in the sphere of vocational education, we like to think of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. uh, and our world is focused so much on supply, and we fail to ask, what does the marketplace really want? What do employers need? Um, and how do we engage employers in uh, creating the curricula which is relevant mm -hmm. so that young people actually are studying something which will, have, which will result in a marketable skill, will result in increased job opportunities. So one of the projects uh, which was a part of the, the grants which were announced today is with the Education Development Center uh, for a project in Tanzania, a center which is going to look at vocational education, engaging um, employers, engaging potential uh, engaging schools, but also helping them ask, answer these questions. What do young people need to learn? And how do we bring in experiential learning into the classroom? Mm -hmm. And how do we send young people out into the community so that they can um, identify opportunities, understand what it's like to be in a workplace? Yeah. Wow. And so and in that process, has, have there been any large surprises in this? Have you gotten, have, have, have your team come to you and said, look, we've got this result is completely counterintuitive? Or by and large, are you finding that the hypotheses you have are being, two, being two, reinforced? Two points. On the, the question, which is in a way odd, I understand why you, you asked the, the way you did about what we're aiming for in terms of the educational outcome. Is this vocational training? Or are we aiming at preparing, is it a college prep course? Whatever. Mm -hmm. But it, it occurs to me, since we work in K through 12 education in the United States, you could ask that question right now with equal force about what we ought to be doing in Chicago public schools or anybody else's public schools in the United States. What are the job skills, if that's what we ought to be preparing for? I mean, there's a a theory out there that what has happened to the middle class has, in the United States has something to do with the absence of a certain kind of job. Certain kinds of needs have changed, and we're trying to figure out at the college, the community college, and uh, the high school level what we ought to be doing. If you, that's just context. So that when you ask us the, the question of what we are trying to accomplish, I would say we're looking to uh, I, this phrase, I'm afraid, is overused now, a, a hockey metaphor, but, you know, no. not, you know, skate to where, you know, the Wayne Gretzky, skate not to where the puck is, but where it's going. Can we anticipate what skills are going to be needed when these girls come out, when the next generation come out? Is it possible that our intervention, as we design it for a variety of challenges, in this world of, of Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia can also be designed to anticipate what kind of jobs are going to be there in their community. Very hard, but very desirable at the same time. And I don't think for a minute we would be excluding the idea that we're going to be, in some cases, preparing these students for college education, tertiary uh, education as well. So. I think the answer is yes, all of the above, but the character of the problem is the same kind of problem that we face outside of that very challenging educational environment. Yeah. And we tend to say here, we at least tend to argue that what is needed is a critical thinking skills, because mm -hmm. the, the whole point is yeah. you, want to, you want to teach people how to learn. Yeah. And there's Absolutely. an assumption that they're going to have to learn something new every three years, something profoundly new. In fact, um, Tom Friedman wrote about this. He was saying how to get a Google job. Yes. Right. In essence, right. you've got to do, know how to do a call center one week and, and read an MRI the next. Right. I think it was, it was something like that. And it does seem to me that this is that this is one of the challenges of what you're of, of what you're doing. And one of the things we should I should just add, and Bob, you see if you agree or disagree, we don't know if everything's going to work. And so this is the whole notion of experimentation and innovating. And I don't know if we'll have a high failure rate, or maybe not high enough. And that's part of the that's a hard part of the whole enterprise. But won't to success try be something else. success? Will be learning. It's a success. And if it's, is if it's a, that's the whole point. And on a good day, failure will be learning. 
right. <laughs> that's right. That's absolutely right. Now, what Bob wanted to make sure that we opened it up for the uh, for the audience. So I'd love to have the lights come up um, and the mics come out, and because everybody in this room uh, has probably thought about some aspect of secondary education, um, but also has thought about the role of collaboration uh, and leadership in philanthropy and the role of knowledge. So we do have a question right here, if, but we do need a microphone up front. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Jessica Posner Odede with Shining Hope for Communities. And I guess my question, this is, just seems like an amazing example of collaboration and of funders working together, but also of the network it creates of grantees mm -hmm. and of, of creating a community. And what have you seen that's happening within this network of partnership and community that is created through this, through this amazing partnership? So the one thing, I, um, I'll jump in and please. Please, uh, please. feel free to jump. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> So for one thing, I think it's going to help elevate the whole need around secondary education. It's going to uh, hopefully accelerate our ability to learn. It's going to create a larger community of both funders as well as organizations implementing and doing the work. I hope that it also engages government. Um, one, one of the exciting things is this last gathering we had where we brought all of the partners together in Nairobi, which we also invited policymakers, and they stayed for the first day, and they stayed the entire day. And, they, and the message, the takeaway message was engage us, and engage us early, so we understand uh, what the evidence is going to be telling us. And I should add that MacArthur, ever, since, since Bob's been there, a big focus of yours has been on trying to advance uh, evidence-based policy making, is what you refer to it we, as. And, we, it, 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 James quite right. We have, uh, we have focused on that, uh, on evidence-based policy. Um, someone once said that's as opposed to policy-derived evidence, and that's certainly true. <laughs> um, uh, and we actually have an area of work where that is key to us and we're looking to interject evidence into difficult policy issues and make that available uh, in, per, in a government context and cooperating. I want to go back to, to the, the first part of your question because when, I, when Reed and I were talking to others, to journalists earlier, one of the things that was striking in the, in the, as we talked about the question that you raised is that I can think of another area or so in which the, I feel as though I've lost my voice here, it, it, uh, in which we collaborate something like this. But it, at least for us, and I won't speak for you, this is fairly unique. I mean, I, I can't say that if I looked across the other areas in which MacArthur works that we have a relationship, anything quite like this. A little bit in the conservation area, we're working with others. but. It's fairly unusual, and I'm, my guess is uh, the world would be better served if there was more of this, generally speaking, analytically, as a collaborative enterprise. Let's see what other questions we have. Over there, we've got a couple over there. Who is unconnected? Hi, I'm Dan Robbins, Cap McTrust, Zimbabwe. We, we've been doing a project in secondary education for about 25 years in Zim little different model in that we're taking rural young women to A-level pre-medical training, so high-performing students in rural areas. And we, in our experience, was kind of realized that the young women were really not prepared to go to that next, le next level kind of culturally and societally. And so it wasn't until we started kind of a tutorial mentoring element, which kind of addressed sort of the psychological fact that they were kind of on the front end of a social change to get them to feel more comfortable in that environment. It's a little different because they were being taken essentially to a higher level boarding school. Um, but I'm wondering if that element has fallen into place in your programs. Have you seen that to be important or is it really happening so broadly in the communities you're working that it hasn't seemed necessary? If, if that is an element, I'm not aware of it. I don't know whether you are. Um, perhaps not in, in immediately in, in the partnership that we have right here, but I, I could say more broadly outside in, in um, other projects where we're working. Mentoring is extremely important, uh, especially working with young women, uh, in it, both in terms of exposing them to what's possible and to 
enabling them to develop the confidence to be able to pursue that because they face multiple levels of barriers. It's not just cost, but it's also family pressure. I think the other critical area of importance is, is putting before them role models, other women uh, from their own communities who've made it, who've crossed the barrier, whatever that barrier might be. And the third piece is which is so important, uh, wherever we can do this, and this we are doing, is ensuring that they are women, women in the classroom who are teaching, uh, but in all spheres, and being able to see active role models who are women. That's very important. It is a, a, uh, one of the basic arguments for separate sex education, um, which even in the United States and even today, but much less than it used to be, um, common to, be, to take the position with some evidence that um, some women will do better in that setting at least for a while, and I'm prepared to believe that. Do, have you learned anything, though, about directly about the relationship between the gender of the teacher and the performance of the student? Yes, in fact, uh, and I'm trying to recall it. I, my recollection is that uh, it wasn't what we thought it might be, but I don't know that I could go much beyond that. <laughs> is, 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 uh, that was pretty misleading, wasn't it? What, <laughs> wait, Raul, are you, are you here somewhere in this, uh, in this audience? Can, can you speak to this? Because I, 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 it would remind me of imagining that we actually, I don't know if it was an RCT, but I thought we did have evidence. There's a microphone on your left there. Yeah. Um, I can certainly try and speak to it. And, um, the evidence is mixed that we've found so far uh -huh. on the issue of the relationship between uh, teacher's gender and girl's student learning outcomes. I, I think one of the things we found compelling is the idea that more important than teacher gender is the gender sensitivity that teachers bring to the classroom, whether it's male or female. And so that has um, certainly informed our own um, intervention strategy and really tried to um, give us the opportunity to focus more on teacher training issues and sensitization in that process, gender, gender sensitization. And we had a question over there, and then back over here with Asha. Hi, uh, this is Asha from the Motwani Jadeja Family Foundation. Um, one of the questions I have is that uh, I'm, I'm actually a technology person. I've been in the venture capital startup world for a long time in the Bay Area. But now I'm trying to do some little bit of work in India right now, and some of the models that we are stum stumbling upon are really pretty radically, you know, out there actually. And one of them that I'm, I'm trying to replicate through our family foundation in India is this whole idea of school in the cloud that uh, mm -hmm. Shugata Mitra got the TED Prize for a couple of years ago. And uh, I just set up one little school in the cloud in a girls' orphanage in Ahmedabad, and and the results are staggering. And it is a teacherless, you know. It, it's a teacherless classroom. Uh, it is self-driven learning, but it's peer-based. So it's five girls together on one 32-inch screen, and they do have the internet minus pornography. We've actually thrown in some technology from Silicon Valley and made it, you know, pornography-free actually. So the kids can just go around. At first few weeks, they were just playing around and you know looking at Bollywood film stars and so on. But <laughs> right after that, they realized the power of the internet, and once they realized that they can find anything on the internet, they started stumbling, stumbling upon exactly what kind of stuff they wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think in sort of, you know, really having a very set curriculum, I mean, are you guys somebody like a partnership like yours, are you open to experimenting with this kind of pretty out there ideas, but, you know, and seeing if that, that, that could be replicated because it will radically alter the cost structure. I, I, I want to start on this because I, uh, some of what you say sounds uh, quite familiar in terms of what I mentioned before we do in our digital media and learning program, which is focused on the United States, not exclusively. We, we are connected here and there internationally, but not necessarily in the worlds of either South Asia or Africa. And uh, just what you say, which is what kids will do when they're exposed to the opportunity that the internet has, um, we have discovered and we have, are working, in fact, with that, with that very insight to see if that can be channeled. And we have a, a phrase for this connected learning for, the, for these kids to connect 
what they want to do with what their peers tell them they should want to do with what we parents and teachers want them to do and, and, and take advantage of just that exploratory instinct that, that kids have. Um, I, I would say second that if there's a general question, are we open to ideas about innovation? The answer is absolutely yes. I can't imagine any other uh, plausibly acceptable answer than that. Rita? Yeah, we're absolutely open. And in fact, in this next round, uh, where we're going to be issuing a call for proposals and call for ideas, there's several categories. So the first category is all about um, testing out new ideas. Um, second category is about really supporting proof of concept. So an idea which has been around for a little bit, but which needs to be tested further in terms of asking how could we scale it. And if there's something with you know, further evidence, we'll be looking at how we scale it. Submit a proposal. <laughs> now, the thing to know about Patricia is she does know how to get a job at Google. She was one of the first hundred employees, so she didn't. She can answer the the Tom uh, the Tom Friedman uh, column. And I think over there we had a question. Yes. Want to not be ignoring this side of the room? Oh, hi, Lisa Bomer with the Conrad Hilton Foundation. Hi. I just wanted to ask you, would you share, us, uh, share with us a little about the mechanics, the partnership, in this case, between MacArthur Foundation and MasterCard and the others, and that are you doing parallel, coordinated grant making? Are you funneling funds into MacArthur? And what guidance would you have? What have you learned regarding how to make these partnerships between foundations work? that could be useful for some of us thinking about similar ventures. Thanks. So I'll, I'll start. Uh, this is a, a, a much more collaborative arrangement than we have at least had, had at MacArthur than in other cases where we've uh, worked with other foundations where the very bare minimum of the collaboration is deconfliction to make sure that you, when you contact another foundation, you're not doing something that undercuts what they're doing or duplicates it in an inefficient sort of way. This goes way beyond that. We actually collaborate on what the request for the RFP is gonna look like uh, and, and put out the RFP uh, on a website. There's one portal through which everybody applies. Uh, we get, as a, as a group, now there, there will be soon seven of us working together in, the, in this third round of RFPs. Uh, and uh, it, in that process, we look at what we want to fund. We come together uh, two or three times, uh, staffs do, to figure out what, where we want to go with this. Sometimes we will jointly fund a, a single uh, NGO, a single project, and other times we'll take different ones. So it is uh, extremely collaborative and requires that kind of coordination but it, I can say, I, I'm reasonably close to this, and Rita can comment on this too, please, that uh, it has been amazingly successful. Uh, and the partnerships, and Joseph is here too from Intel, he's right there. Uh, we, we work uh, extremely well together, I think. Yeah, you said it beautifully. I think if you look back, Diana, Diana Arsinian is here from Carnegie Corporation, and. Back in the 1990s, the Carnegie, at least when I was there, Carnegie and, uh, and MacArthur worked very closely together in the peace and security mm -hmm. realm. But that tended to happen on the program officer level or the program chair level more than on the level of the presidents. It isn't that they didn't support it, but that wasn't where the initiative tended to come well, from. It happened that I sat next to Vartan at a coordinated meeting with Carnegie on arms control, how long ago, a month ago or so. So we're coordinating again in this area. Yeah. Right. But also, you know, partnership of higher education in Africa, which was a major collaborative effort among seven partner foundations. Right. These so that for those who didn't hear that, that's higher education in Africa is where they're partnering as well. And there were a group of hands there. And I want to make sure if there's anybody to my right that I'm not missing you. Uh, okay, Toyin. So we have one question there and then to Toyin. Hi, I'm oops, sorry. <laughs> I'm Pallav Joshi with Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Um, and I, I work for the nonprofit, and, and I'm really positive, and I'm really impressed by the work that you are doing. 
but I can't help but think about my Indra, India trip that I had a month ago. And uh, in the house there was a maid, the maid's daughter, who was studying and did everything right. And there she was, trying to work in a factory. They got a night shift, unsafe for women. Again, going back to the same cycle of working as a maid. Now, I mean, you, you, you just keep thinking about you know, what it is that you can do to ultimately change the life of a person. Obviously, over time, if we, if we continue to do this, we're hoping that change will happen over generations. But have you thought about, uh, and I'm sure you have actually, but, uh, you know, outcomes that, that not only touch different levels, but sort of holistically as a person. So if somebody has studied, then a job, then marriage, then y you know what I'm saying. I mean, it just, it's sort of a very broad question, but I thought I'd bring it up as well. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Is your question about how do you break cycles? Uh, yes, but sort of more, yes, on an individual, one-by-one -one basis, rather than, you know, addressing higher education versus jobs, or, you know what I mean? Yes, yes. So perhaps outside of this particular partnership, uh, we're involved in an initiative to look more holistically at how young people transition. And we know that it's not a linear path, and the transition may start from school to work, or the world of work. It may start from unemployment to some form of unemployment. It may start from what we would call hazardous or undignified work to a better place, to a slightly better place. And that journey, there is no bridge. There isn't, there isn't always a clear path. But that journey usually requires a higher touch, more holistic, and for funders, in some cases, higher cost. Um, but with, with the promise, with the promise, not necessarily a guarantee, with the promise of a much better outcome. And that, that wraparound would be, you would think about it, whether it's in a formal or non-formal circumstance, it's skills. It's sometimes life skills, not just a technical skill, but life skills. Mm -hmm. uh, it is about self-esteem and confidence building, mentoring, which we, we spoke about a moment ago, it's about access to employers or access to, access to social networks, which lead to opportunities. And it's also access to finance. Something, um, and, but the, what is the formula? Or how do we put that whole package together holistically uh, and in a seamless manner? That's what we still need to learn. But uh, we have seen examples in smaller, in, um, probably at a, a smaller scale, more modest scale, of what happens when someone does transition. It's not just that person, it's the whole family. Uh, and more than just the whole family, that person becomes a role model in their village. They become an icon in terms of what you know, each family could aspire for. So that, that, that's part of the magic, but, it, but it's also very hard work, and we don't have all the answers. This is a perfect segue, I can tell, to Toyin. Everybody, my name is Toyin Zaraki of the Wellbeing Foundation Africa, headquartered in Nigeria. I actually got up to thank you, because in my years of working at the front line, I've seen lots and lots of well-meaning NGOs and partnerships come and bring programs to us at the front line that are well-intentioned but aren't actually particularly responsive or domesticated to the individual needs of the communities. And watching that film, I could see that even though secondary education was the aim, that the three locations had quite different programs. Yeah. And that showed me a level of responsiveness to the local need that is something that we really, really need in Africa. It gave me particular joy to see the girls in the north of Nigeria being at school because we've been recently working to stamp out child marriage. And those of us who come from those regions and have daughters who are also Muslims know that actually when you start to cover a girl's head, mm. it's to preserve her modesty because she's also old enough to be proposed to. So some savvier ones amongst us actually delay covering her head so that we don't receive proposals for our daughters. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you. Mm. Now the aid is matching the need. 
Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that I, I actually I think it's time to close unless we give those two. There were two hands there, so I don't want to be unfair. So why don't we just take two more, um, and then I have a question for Bob. I've learned that when, when it's supposed to be a Rita question, Bob narrows his eyes, and that means it goes to Rita. So what you mean and Rita knows that, that too. <laughs> when you feel it should be a Rita question. Yes, like I do that? Yeah, you did. No, that. I have a it's tell. very effective. So uh, you should play poker with me. <laughs> That's right. I decided I can't play poker yeah. with, uh, yeah. with Rita earlier. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne Ehlers with PAI in DC. And I so enjoyed this conversation. And I guess a couple of themes have come out, maternal mortality and child marriage. And I'm wondering, I think I took for granted that these collaborations between foundations were more common than they seem to be and that they were easier maybe to undertake. I guess my question is on kind of collaboration within a foundation. So have you found out of this partnership within MasterCard or MacArthur, you know, because the conservation work that you've mentioned, Mr. Gallucci, I think is that. So, so are we combining our secondary education efforts with access to contraception? Are we combining what we're learning about keeping girls in school with our efforts around gender-based violence? So I, I can't help but look at my Vice President for International Programs, who's <laughs> sitting in front of me, squinting, and he's beginning to twitch a little bit. Uh, so, uh, fa cooperation within a foundation. Uh, so, a, a bit of organizational theory. Uh, there's a reason why. Um, organizational processes look like they do, whether it's the government, the private sector, NGOs, or even the great foundations. Uh, it, it's because people uh, get separate tasks, and they go to those tasks, and they feel a responsibility for them. And collaboration is not instinctive. Uh, collaboration means sharing sometimes resources, uh, sometimes decision making, so it's, it can be a painful thing organizationally. I know you know none of this, that's why I'm telling you this. No, I, I know you know this, but I, it's the only way of saying that I've found uh, in government, uh, where I spent 150 years, and then at the university, another 100 years, and now in foundation life, that that internal collaboration is not easy. That, uh, and even when we know uh, that uh, as I used to say when I was in government and was responsible for political military affairs, nobody ever ran into my office saying, we've got a terrible problem in political science in the Middle East. I mean, people don't talk that way and they have problems. And, and similarly in the foundation, if we wish to deal with climate change, we sort of suspect climate change takes place in the United States as well as the rest of the world, even though the United States is a separate program area from the rest <laughs> of the world, right? We know that, but we don't actually do it instinctively. Uh, or we may, we may know that immigration and migration is a problem around the world, but also in the United States. But if it's a different program area, then we have a, so we have to actually work at creating cross-foundation programs and once you do that, you, people will collaborate and they will work together. But it's harder work. This is what I think Larry Kramer was talking about when he spoke to this. It isn't instinctive. Uh, and uh, it, I, I was trying to make the point before that um, it, it, it doesn't or hasn't happened uh, on any of really the other areas at, at quite the way we've managed to do it um, in this area of secondary education. Uh, and I'm very pleased about this. I think it's been very productive. I have seen, actually, I don't know whether I should say this out loud, it's bad luck, but I've seen no real organizational pathologies uh, in the course of this activity, at least that, that okay. I've, I've identified. So I've just been very pleased. So I think you being terribly modest because uh, you have a phenomenal team and I'm sure there's a lot more collaboration. Maybe without your knowledge, that's actually also taking place. I'll give you a little ray of sunshine. 
You know, our, our foundation is um, much smaller in terms of human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we started, I was the fourth employee at the foundation. So we just didn't know better uh, because everybody had to, the four of us had to do everything. And as we grew, that just became a mainstay of how we've worked. And I think one of the richest and most enriching part, uh, parts of being at the foundation is the fact that people talk to each other all the time and different, and different functions or different role, people who play different roles are involved in the grant making process. Uh, sometimes that, that can slow things down and sometimes it makes it harder. But the fun part of it is to have people come around a concept and ask questions. And the very act of asking questions stimulates a whole other momentum yeah. in terms of uh, work. So it's possible. It's possible. And have you extended this longer than you originally intended? Or did you picture, how many years did you plan on, on this collaborative going when you first started? What did you imagine? I was thinking 50, 60 years. 50, 60 years <laughs> to go with the rest of your tenure in other sectors. <laughs> So squint your eyes and I'll turn to Rita. Uh, Rita, what were you thinking of in terms of, of timetable for, for, you know, at, at the beginning? I think we left it kind of open-ended. We said, let's, yeah. let's just try it and see, and see where it goes. And yeah. so here we are, we're you know, issuing the third RFP. And I yeah. think it'll be pretty exciting. I hope it, I hope, I, my sense is it's going to have some staying power. So I wanted to also ask about another sector, because Khalid's here and others. And, oh, oh, we'll, we'll have a word from the Vice President. Oh, yes. You, you, this will, it'll make my life a lot easier if you would call on Barry for, for a rejoinder. Barry, yeah. go. You, you asked the question about the uh, internal dynamics, how, how um, offices cooperate. Let me give you two examples. We formed part of an organization called the MacArthur, the, uh, the Uganda Fund in the aftermath of the hellacious war with the Lord's Resistance Army. And we opened a school, and this was a human rights issue. It was the Pader Academy in northern Uganda. All right, that's human rights and education. We brought in girls that were just, that went through horrors. And yet, their families did not want them. So we took them in. So you start with basic education. And this has been going on for the better part of a decade. I took a team out a year and a half ago. I took my conservation director. He looks around and he says, this forest is completely ravaged by the war. I said, what would it take to get it back? He said, why don't we train girls here? Why don't we add a, a part of the curriculum that teaches them the science, the agronomy, to try to reclaim that? And we're starting that this fall. That's one example. And another one is the cook stoves in Africa. The thing about cook stoves, it's human rights and it's conservation, it's protection of women. These are the kinds of things you get out in the field, you bring your teams out there, and they start seeing the connections. And you stop twitching now. Like, like I said, it's <laughs> natural at MacArthur that we cooperate. <laughs> <laughs> So I just wonder, because we've, we've talked about um, basically informing other, pol informing policymakers, informing parents and teachers, uh, informing fellow philanthropists. Um, there are intergovernmental efforts uh, in this area. There's, there's the Global Education First Initiative of Ban Ki-moon's. And I'm just wondering, as I look out and see uh, a UNDP leader uh, before we saw Khaled Malik sitting there, are there, uh, are you interacting with intergovernmental organizations as well, like the UN, mm -hmm. um, and sort of passing knowledge back and forth, uh, transferring knowledge between you? Is that a, a piece of what you do? Well, certainly a piece of what we do is to disseminate knowledge broadly yeah. uh, and to ensure that we continue to enlarge the community of learning. And uh, we would welcome exchanging knowledge with, with the UN with, and as well as other funders, all, all forms of funding. So I, I, I want to thank them, but I first want to be able to ask Bob a question that's on a totally different subject. Can I squint at her, do you think? Yeah. And, and I'm going to ignore your squinting. Okay. But Rita will answer it well. We know that. Um, tomorrow we're all going to hear from the foreign minister of Egypt, Nabil Fahmi. You know him well because he was in the disarmament world, the arms control and disarmament world, mm -hmm. before he was foreign minister. And because our kids went to high school together. But that's another story. Really? In Washington? Yeah. It was he, he was ambassador then? He was the ambassador, then? yeah. I want to know what question you would have asked him if you were here. 
when he spoke? Uh, I, that's actually not a hard question. Uh, I'd want, it'd be, a, you'd ask him a different question if he were in a chair in front of this audience, probably, so I'm not necessarily recommending this to you. Um, but I want to know what he sees looking ahead. I want to know how he sees this being resolved. I want to know what he sees. I mean, this is, you can pick any number of countries to capture the phenomenon of, quote, Arab Spring. But uh, in very important ways, there's, there is no circumstance that more captures um, that region than does Egypt's plight. Uh, and to, to have him, uh, and he's quite capable, maybe more than any other Egyptian, at least that I know, to speak to the question of how this gets resolved so that you have both an open and democratic system and one that continues to work. Um, it's realizing justice in that circumstance, uh, capturing democracy, uh, continuing with development, giving a voice to all, very challenging, and, but no circumstance obviously more important, I would think, than Egypt. Yeah. I wish you were going to be here tomorrow. Well, me too. <laughs> so please join me in thanking these two extraordinary leaders and for their collaboration. Thank you. And ready yourself for your questions to the foreign minister. So is that okay?